Hi everyone, my name is Megan Peters and I'm an assistant professor of cognitive sciences at UC Irvine. And today I'm going to give you a taste of what my lab does and the projects that we are currently working on. So uh, your brain is constantly making decisions it's about the most likely cause of the sensory signals it's getting. Those decisions, of course, come with uncertainty, decisional uncertainty. So here's a concrete real world example that I like to use for this. So you're driving down a foggy road, you think you see something up ahead here, you have to decide if that's a deer, a car, or a tree, so you can react accordingly. But of course, what comes along with this decision is about the most likely identity of the object uh, is the uh, sense of uncertainty or confidence. So having decided that it is a car, you have to also decide how sure you are that you made the right choice. Um, so maybe it's definitely a car or it's probably a car, but you're not really sure. So this is the kind of decisional uncertainty that I'm talking about. Your brain is constantly computing this, giving you access to that information because you can report your confidence in what you think you see. So this confidence or uncertainty goes into lots of areas in our everyday lives, not necessarily just perception. Uh, and so some examples are how fast should I drive under these road conditions, or where was that sound? Where was that coming from so that I can react accordingly? Uh, should I keep studying for the test tomorrow? This is also a metacognitive decision, um, or is this diagnosis correct? So these are all cases where you are not only evaluating the outcome of a first order decisional process, but also the uh, likelihood that that process gave you a good or correct or reliable answer. So uh, these, these aspects of decisional uncertainty are also of increasing importance to other scientists who are studying or building artificial systems like Watson or self-driving cars, for example. So you kind of want your Tesla to be able to do this too. And it's also of interest to researchers studying and trying to treat some diseases like autism or schizophrenia. So I'm gonna talk about a few of these diseases today. Um, so basically this is the crux of what we study in my lab from a lot of different computational and general standpoints. Uh, uncertainty, how the brain computes this, what it has to do with metacognitive evaluation in general, um, and also what this decisional uncertainty has to do with consciousness and how we can use uh, the metacognitive computations and their neural correlates or neural underpinnings to try to get at conscious awareness. This is a main thrust of the focus of the research in my lab. And so today I'm excited to share with you uh, a little taste of what's going on in the lab in terms of real projects. Okay, so basically uh, as, a, as a broad overview, in my lab we're using a combination of psychophysics and functional neuroimaging and computational modeling and also artificial intelligence and machine learning to focus on this topic with a few specific questions in mind. So the kind of three big questions that I wanna focus on right now are where, when, and how does the brain engage in metacognitive computations? And also, what can that tell us about consciousness? Uh, what is metacognition uh, good for? And also, what can that tell us about consciousness? And so it really always comes down to what can the study of the neural and computational correlates of metacognition tell us about that subjective sense uh, that we carry around with us in our heads whenever we perceive the world? So to give you a taste of what this is like, let's go straight into uh, a whirlwind tour of some of the current projects in the lab. So we'll start with the main projects here in the lab at UCI. Uh, so the first one that I wanted to tell you about is this one on uh, what we're calling meta perception in psychophysics. Um, to use psychophysics and computational modeling to isolate the meta and consciousness bits of our decision-making capacity. So one of the hardest things that we have to do in studying consciousness and metacognition is to really isolate the meta bits, the consciousness bits, from the underlying signals that contribute to the decisions themselves. So usually your confidence and therefore your consciousness uh, are correlated with your accuracy in some perceptual task. So the better you are at the task, the more confident you're going to feel or the more aware of the stimulus you're going to feel. So uh, experimentally, what we have to do is try to find a way to isolate the confidence or the consciousness bits so that whatever neural or computational correlates we find don't end up being contaminated by those computations, the ones that control like your signal processing capacity, your first order judgments. So going back to that car example from the first slide, uh, this is trying to isolate 
uh, these little bubbles here, that that's definitely a car or that's probably a car from uh, the decision-making signals that go into that is a car, that first order decision here. So uh, with Brian Maniscalco and Alinka in my lab and also with Brian Odegaard and Jorge Morales, we're working on using psychophysics to tease apart these computations by creating conditions where confidence varies due to some specific ways that we kind of play around with the stimulus, um, but even though task performance is matched. So uh, task performance is held constant, and then we manipulate your confidence in the task. So specifically in this particular project, what we wanted to do is measure the whole range of what we're calling these meta-perceptual functions. So this is as a function of your signal processing capacity, how confident do you feel? So this is the relationship between your meta perception and your perceptual performance capacity. But you can also see in these experimental results here that we found a way to manipulate confidence independent of task performance itself across the entire range of your performance. So uh, this is one way that we can isolate the neural and computational correlates of confidence going forward to try to get at really what's going on there. And if you're interested in learning more about this project, you can head on over to our preprint on BioArch or on Psych Archive uh, and, and read a little bit more about it. It's a really fun project. Okay, so a uh, second kind of thrust in, in my lab is that, you know, just because confidence and metacognition uh, co-vary, usually you feel more confident, the more likely you are to be correct. Uh, sometimes they also behave in strange ways. And so even though confidence should get higher as you get better at a task, as I just showed you previously, it should at least not get lower. Uh, but sometimes you can fiddle around with a stimulus to make you more and more confident, even when you are totally wrong about your decision. So you feel like you're doing great, but you're actually wrong. So uh, in a project that Brian Maniscalco and I did a couple years ago with Hakon Lau, uh, uh, we, we started to isolate these kinds of metacognitive computations. And since then, Brian and I have been working on a biologically plausible neural network model. So that's what's shown here, um, which might explain why these dissociations between confidence and, and uh, type one decisional capacity, why those dissociations occur. So in this project, what we've done is built an accumulation framework model uh, that exhibits this biologically plausible aspect of uh, the underlying neural circuitry, which is called tuned normalization, which is the idea that uh, some uh, neurons are more uh, normalized by the surrounding network activity, they're more inhibited, and other neurons are less normalized and activate, uh, act kind of more independently. Um, and so we've built an accumulation framework that takes into account these neural, uh, these neural uh, aspects, which have been found in both monkey and human brains. Um, and when we use this model to try to understand how confidence and decisions can behave together in ways that they can sometimes dissociate, we can see that it reproduces some odd patterns of what's called metacognitive efficiency, uh, which here is measured by a quantity called meta d prime. So this is the idea that uh, your confidence should track your accuracy every trial. But uh, here, uh, the experimental results, which are uh, the dashed lines, show that metacognitive efficiency goes down even as decision capacity goes up under certain experimental conditions. And our model can reproduce this effect. So this gives us some good evidence, a good hypothesis, uh, that the neurons that are contributing to the confidence choices or the confidence evaluations are possibly uh, these less normalized neurons here, these independent accumulators. And the neurons that are contributing to the decisions themselves are perhaps these more normalized kind of differencing units. So this is a great hypothesis that we now have to go forward and test in actual uh, neural circuitry using neuroimaging techniques. Um, so that's great for a model that it behaves so well and that it can capture the behavior. But ultimately, we're also interested in whether this is actually how the brain does it, not just how the brain could be doing it. Uh, and so we want to test that, that modeling hypothesis by going into the neuroimaging uh, and actually um, looking at the brain. So uh, this is now a project that Brian and I are doing with my grad student Shada in the lab, uh, where we're working on developing uh, stimuli that will isolate these different populations of neurons so that the less normalized and more normalized neurons can be separated at the voxel level so we can actually see it using functional neuroimaging. 
So we're designing these special stimuli so that we can go and look at which voxels are more or less normalized or contain more or less proportions of, of more and less normalized neurons um, and to see how those end up co-varying with the choices and confidence behavior that our participants display in the scanner. So this is an ongoing project here. We've collected some good pilot data already and Shada is hard at work analyzing uh, those results. So of course, there's another way to test the model too though. Uh, which is that ultimately we don't want to just look for correlations, we want to look for causal evidence that these models are correct. Um, and so the next step of this project going forward with Brian and Shada and several others is to use uh, something called decoded neurofeedback to kind of push on the voxels that we identify as more or less neurons and then uh, and their connections to other patterns of neural activity as well to try to see if the model actually works to predict behavior the way we're, that we think that it does. So uh, decoded neurofeedback, which is what's shown in this slide, this is also known as real-time fMRI. Uh, it's a method by which you can uh, kind of read out the brain activity patterns using the MRI machine in as close to real time as you can get in fMRI. So fMRI is kind of slow on the order of one to two second um, temporal resolution, uh, but here we can read it out kind of at every time point that the machine is taking a brain reading. And what we do here then is um, we look at whether the patterns of brain activity that are coming in in almost a real time basis match the patterns of activity that we've previously identified as being related to a target pattern of interest. So here, what we're going to do is identify those more and less normalized voxels that I told you about previously using those spe specially designed stimuli. And then we're gonna go try to push on them using this, this, um, this technique. And so the way that we push on them is you read out the voxel patterns of activity, uh, you compare them to a target pattern of activity. And if those two patterns match, if the actual brain activity matches the target pattern of activity, you give people feedback that they're doing a good job. And if the target pattern of activity is not a match to the real brain activity, then you tell them that they're doing a bad job. And over time, it looks like people are actually able to learn to produce the target patterns of brain activity. And then we can use this technique to check whether those changing patterns of brain activity over time actually correlate with real changes in the behavior that the participants are producing uh, as predicted by our computational model. So this is the next step of this project and we're really excited to get this going here at, at UCI. So all of the stuff that I've told you about so far is of course really great for understanding how typically developing people do metacognition um, and how typically developing uh, brains do metacognitive, co metacognitive computations. Um, but of course, we're also interested in exploring cases where metacognition breaks down. So a lot of times a really interesting aspect of a model is that it doesn't only explain how a system works, but it also breaks in the same way that a system breaks in a real human. So uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are a potentially really good way to start to get at some of these cases where metacognition breaks down. These are really debilitating disorders. They cost us a lot of money in healthcare costs, uh, at, especially in this country. And so uh, in order to get better insight into the cognitive deficits in these populations, we wanted to design experiments that uh, older participants with neurodegenerative diseases would be able to do um, in the, with the idea that we could eventually have real clinical impact and help devise new intervention strategies in the future. Um, and so specifically, these, uh, these neurodegenerative disorders of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are really interesting because they also link to metacognition in a very specific way. A lot of these patients don't actually know that they're sick. So this is a metacognitive deficit known as anosinosia, the lack of knowing essentially. Uh, and so in this project, um, Vanessa and, and I are working with a local hospital, Casa Colina, to create these tasks that older adults and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's patients will be able to engage in. Uh, so here is the task where we show you some faces and we ask you to kind of pick which face you think is the most attractive one. And again, we're manipulating the underlying task to very specifically get at the computations underlying metacognition. So we design this cute little task and then we also uh, pair this with clinical ratings of symptom severity and with some structural MRI uh, of these particular patients so that we can characterize the extent of neurodegenerative 
uh, neurodegeneration in target regions of the cortex, specifically like frontal areas of the brain, which tend to degenerate first in some of these disorders and which also are specifically involved in metacognitive capacity, as we know from some previous literature. So uh, the goal here is to heavily integrate the behavioral and the, the neurodegeneration uh, gray matter volume findings together um, with the, the eventual goal of leading to early detection strategies and a better understanding of prognosis uh, that we could get potentially even with just behavioral tests if we can make the links between behavior and brain. Okay. So we also have a few other projects that are a little more tangentially related to metacognition and consciousness than the ones that I just told you about. Uh, so this is one of them. Um, so here uh, we're interested in understanding the flow of information from one region to the next. Um, and so uh, in, in particular, we're interested in understanding the flow of information to prefrontal cortex, which is, as I mentioned, an area of the brain that is particularly involved in metacognitive computations and consciousness. Um, so to get at the, the computations that this area is doing, one of the possible ways forward would be to understand which information is actually going to and also from this region and the nature of that information itself. So its content, its dimensionality, and other quantifiable properties of essentially this arrow, the information flow going forward into the prefrontal cortex. So one of the ways we've been uh, using to work on this problem uh, with my grad student, Mehdi, is by relying on some recent advances in machine learning architectures. Uh, here, we're not using machine learning and neural networks as a model of exactly how the brain is doing this, but more as a tool to ask and answer these questions about the info that's going to and from uh, the prefrontal cortex. Um, so here we're using autoencoders uh, plus classifiers, basically neural networks, to extract out the compressed representation of the information flowing between two regions of the brain. So what an autoencoder does is it essentially finds a mapping between an input space and an output space, which allows it to extract out this lower dimensional kind of essence of what is being represented in the inputs and outputs. Um, and usually you train an autoencoder to reproduce the same uh, the same outputs as the input images that it got during training. But here what we're doing is using it to map information between two areas of the brain. So in this case, this is uh, the ventral temporal cortex, which is an object-oriented area of the brain, and the prefrontal cortex, which is that area I just told you about. So uh, to do this, we're relying on a data set that has generously been shared with us uh, by Vincent Tashro de Michel and a lot of other people, including Hakwan. Um, and we're exploring how different architectures of this autoencoder structure can maximally extract the task relevant information in this compressed area uh, while minimizing some other irrelevant factors. Okay, um, and here's another machine learning project that we're, that we're working on here in the lab. Uh, and so this one is a little bit more on the conceptual side. So Andrew has been working on um, what we're calling an auto noetic meta learning neural network architecture. The idea here is that you're building a neural network that can avoid catastrophic forgetting. So that's what meta-learning does uh, when it learns over multiple domains. So again, meta-learning approaches in artificial intelligence, they try to train networks to learn tasks across multiple different domains. And this is really hard for current artificial intelligence to do uh, because often when it learns a new task, it totally forgets what it learned for a previous task. Um, so that's, what, that's what's called catastrophic forgetting. And uh, the networks that Andrew is working on um, try to avoid this problem essentially by engaging in introspective or metacognitive type computations. So these networks kind of ask themselves which exemplars and which aspects of those exemplars in the training set are maximally informative to which types of tasks um, and also to the learning process in general. And then they can adjust, these networks can adjust their own internal architectures and training trajectories to maximize learning and avoid that catastrophic forgetting. So Andrew is really leveraging these current advances in meta-learning with insights from neuroscience and in introspection and explainable AI to try to tackle this problem. Okay, so uh, in the last couple of minutes, I just wanna tell you very briefly about a couple of collaborative projects that we have um, from my previous faculty position at UC Riverside. So uh, the first one that I want to tell you about is this set of projects that I'm working on with Aaron Seitz uh, and also with Xiaoping Hu and Masa and Kimia and Sana. 
um, to develop ways to understand how the locus ceruleus, which is a small uh, noradre noradrenergic nucleus in the uh, brainstem, how, this, uh, how the LC system influences sensory representations and arousal and decision-making by manipulating representational uncertainty in the brain. And in this set of projects, we're using a combination of multivoxel pattern analysis and decoding and some behavioral approaches and also some hidden Markov models and even also some EEG and pupillometry to try to computationally characterize this LC circuit and its influence on uncertainty of sensory representations in the brain. And the last project that I'm going to tell you about uh, is a little bit different, but you'll, you'll notice some common themes. Uh, so this one is with Kalina uh, and Dana at UC Riverside as well. And uh, here we're trying to use multivoxel, multivoxel pattern similarity analysis to understand how the fidelity of neural representations of feared objects and also how their representational similarity in perceptual versus emotional circuitry. So essentially how the, the differences or similarities in the neural representations of things that you have come to fear, um, how they uh, differ across perceptual and affective regions, and how these differences or similarities may uh, explain or at least contribute to cases of pediatric anxiety in kids ages 8 through 13. And so if you'd like to know more about this project, you can check out the paper that we just published together, which uh, came out earlier this year in Neuropsychologia. Okay, so that is the whirlwind tour through the research being done in my group and in collaborative efforts, um, both here at UCI and also at, at UC Riverside and elsewhere. So I didn't have time to tell you about everything that we are working on. There's a lot more going on under the hood, but this gives you a little bit of, of, of a taste. Um, and lastly, I wanted to mention that we've got also some exciting outreach projects that are going on, uh, which includes uh, this project that Brian Odegaard and I are running to help push consciousness research into the mainstream of funding sources here in the United States um, to help drive this field forward in the future as well. Uh, so that's really it. Special thanks to my lab members, all of their hard work. And I also want to thank my many collaborators, friends, and funding sources for their contributions to these projects. And I am looking forward to hearing all of your questions soon. Thanks for watching. <laughs>